So we will be 1 Corinthians 15. Um, if you didn't hear that, also, I, I know there's a few of you here that haven't met for the first time. If you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles up here. Does anyone not have a Bible that they could use or need? Okay. Just want to make sure because we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture. Want to make sure you can actually read along. You know, one thing that we tell you guys to do as we come up here and teach is um, the, the pulpit is not two things. This is not in a place to spout off opinions, right? This isn't, I'm just some you know, modern looking dude, just sharing with you some helpful information for your life. And we are also not uh, lords over you. Uh, we are proclaimers of a word that we've been given by our Lord. And you ought to be good hearers of the word and to make sure that what is actually said in it is actually what it says. And I just, I want to, I want to clarify that because I think people often come into church and they have a mixed idea of what we're even doing when we come here. And I don't want you to be confused about who stands in the pulpit. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. And this is the last of our series that we've been doing on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I think this is, uh, I mean, it's fitting just because of what we're going to flesh out uh, of, of this study. But I do think that out of all of the ones that we have heard, this one is probably the least familiar to you and the le- and, and the one that is actually the most odd in this whole group. Right? So we've talked about Christ's person and his deity and his humanity. And we've also talked about Christ and his work as he comes in and he is the fulfillment of all of the law and the prophets. As he comes in and operates as a prophet and a priest and a king, he comes in and he accomplishes redemption for God's people. Uh, But brethren, there's one more that we need to make sure that we have crystal clear when it comes to the work of Jesus Christ, and that is the resurrection. And I just, I want to ask this just to start off because I want to, I want to make a point. I want you to be honest with yourself. I'm not going to ask anybody to share their thoughts, but I think your thoughts will nonetheless reveal to yourself at least uh, why this one is so odd and why this one is so often forgotten in the church. So I want you to ask yourself this. What role does the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead play in your life? What role does it play? And I know it's an odd question, because I can say that about any doctrine. How does the deity of Jesus Christ play into your life? But hopefully that one's easy. Well, if he's God, I owe him obedience and worship. So, put it now into the resurrection. What does Jesus Christ's resurrection, His rising from the dead and being seated with the Father, and the resurrection of the dead that Christians have confessed for 2,000 years have to do with your life? Or does it even mean anything for your life? And I think if we were to ask ourselves, of what importance is it to us? Do you actually consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ as vital importance for your Christian life? The answer would probably be no. And I don't mean to say that for you and for myself to make you feel bad, but I want to just paint for you the picture that when those questions get asked, especially about this topic, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it shows that we have thought very little of it. And it shows that we know very little why the resurrection is even important. And to go back to what I said this whole series was about, how the resurrection, how does the resurrection even fit into Christ's work? What does that even mean? That Christ's work is the work of resurrection. What does that even mean? And I think you answering, answering those questions honestly paints for yourself. I don't think I need even answer for you. I think all of us could agree we have thought very little about this. And we know very little a bit about it, which to our own shame is, is to our shame. The, the Bible makes much of it and the church is just simply not. And so I, I, I want us to consider this. But church, I, I, want, I want to paint that for you, not so much to make you feel bad about something, because I don't think what we're doing here as a church is rejecting this truth. By no means do I think we're doing that. And I also don't think that given the time we've been here together as a church, that we've been lazy to not discuss this topic. I mean, we've been here for, 
you know, a, a few months kind of officially, but we've been doing this since last January. And uh, if you haven't noticed, there's a lot to say about the Bible. And so not hitting every single topic in Christianity is just not doable within a year's time frame. And if you want that to be done, then we'll be preaching for like two and a half hours. So I don't think you want that either. But the point is just this. Let's listen, church. I, I want us to be... I want us to be pushed further in our thinking about this, but I'm also not trying to push you and to back you into a corner to make you feel bad that you don't know this. I just simply want us all, including myself, to recognize that we have thought very little about the resurrection. Just very little about it. And I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that in answering those questions, it, it kind of lands with some penetrating force for your heart, because I think it does for me. I've been a Christian for almost 10 years, and I've barely given this thought until the last two. And I think that is just an example, church, that this has gone under the Christian radar of doctrine and of practice and of teaching and of any significance for the Christian life. But we need to give ourselves to this. And I think part of the reason is, is uh, we live in America. And American Christianity has been mixed with all sorts of Bad things. What was once, I think, a, a very vibrant Christianity has been mixed with all sorts of bad theology in our own day of us dealing with a, a secularized worldview where all there is is nature, and once you die, you're dead and you're gone. And I think combining those two of our American Christianity, bad theology, the secular worldview, the resurrection literally just has no luster to it. It's like it's lost its shine. It's just dull. It's just a it's just a tradition that the church has just kept for 2000 years, but we have no earthly idea why dead bodies being brought back to life and being given resurrected bodies is of any importance for us. And I think that backdrop just makes that clear. Our Christianity doesn't even know what to do with it. And, 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 and in fact, the world doesn't know what to do with something like that. It doesn't even make any sense. But I want us to go back to that first question. Because if that's not to topple on us just not really understanding this, we still need to answer, okay, as we work through what the resurrection is, what we also need to be able to do is for that resurrection to be important for us, we actually need to be able to tie it to Jesus' work. Because if it's not a part of His work, then it really doesn't matter if we've confessed the resurrection for 2,000 years. The church history is important, but the weight is not left in just history. The weight is left in Scripture. And if Christ does not perform a work of resurrection and accomplishing it for us, then we could sit here and talk all day about it, but it doesn't really mean anything. So we need to be able to have a grounding in this, an understanding of this that goes beyond simply a historical understanding of some man that died and that is claimed to be raised from the dead, and it needs to even go beyond us as a church having confessed that truth for 2,000 years. It needs to actually be shown that this is what Jesus Christ is and has and will accomplish. We need to be able to display that. So let me ask the question one more time for you guys. What is the work of resurrection that Christ performs and accomplishes? I want you to be thinking about that. What is the work? What does he do? How does it happen? What does it accomplish? And, and then therefore, what is the importance of resurrection? What importance should it even have for your life? Does it even matter? I want to show you uh, a few things. First, I think this will kind of set the tone for what we just talked about here in the introduction, is that there's going to be a central issue that Paul, who is writing this to churches, is bringing to their attention when it comes to resurrection. It's going to be found in verse 12. So our first point of issue, what I'm calling the crux of the issue, is going to be found here in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 18. And then from there, we're going to move out and see how Paul continues to build this argument. But I want to be able to show you is that as he develops this idea for us, he does so systematically. It's like he's stacking together a nice set of bricks for you to give you a structure so that you can look at the resurrection in a very robust way. 
I want you to be able to see it that way too, because I think it'll help correct some of those things that we uh, were talking about. So that's where we're going to begin. And I kind of just want you to hear, not, not, I mean, you can follow along, but I, I want you to imagine, you know, you being Paul writing this, saying this, because I think if you're able to kind of read it in your own minds and kind of assume, okay, why is Paul saying something like this? You might get kind of the feeling that should come across with this question that gets asked, because uh, oftentimes scripture will, scripture will do this where it asks certain questions and it says something in a rhetorical fashion, but we say it with the way that we usually hear the Bible read in church and we go, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? And it just sounds like this very boring, lifeless question because that's how you hear the Bible read in church. And I don't want you to think that. I want you to think of how Paul, who is miles away from Corinth, from these people, sought urgency to send this to them for their correction. And I want you to hear the questions and then what follows with that, with the sense of urgency. And I want you to be in Paul's shoes there asking these things. And I am going to read it the way I think that it should be read, not boring, so that you kind of get the feel of that too. So here's the crux of the issue. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. Church, I want you to hear that. Here's the crux of the issue right here in chapter, in, excuse me, in verse 12. And Paul asks a singular, simple question. If Christ, Jesus Christ, is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you proclaim that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that question obviously begs the question of what is going on here. And what is going on is this. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the third day. He appeared before many, as we confess, right, in our opening confession today. And then he ascended on high and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And some people are then concluding that there is no resurrection of the dead. And Paul is coming in with full force and authority in saying, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, then how can some of you say this? How could you say that? There's no resurrection of the dead if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead. How could you say this? And then he follows their line of argument. Notice this is not Paul giving you a, a theology uh, of his resurrection. Rather, he's answering the question that is being put forth. It's like he's got this person he's arguing with here. No doubt people in Corinth were saying this. Christians were saying this. And he follows their logic. Because we know back in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, what does Paul proclaim? What does he proclaim? He proclaims... The gospel, what does he say? He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached. Very, very similar word category there, preach, proclaim, very similar thing, of which you received, in which you stand, by which you're being saved. And he says, for I delivered you as of first importance, what? Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised. So Paul has proclaimed this. He's proclaimed Christ as raised from the dead. So now, these people are saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And he's asking, how on earth could that be? Let's follow your line of reasoning. Verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. 
Now, you may not think that to be uh, immediately a grave concern for you to think about. But I want to ask you this. The gospel that Paul proclaims there in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, what does it mean when it says that Christ was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture? What does it mean that Christ was resurrected? What does that word mean? He was buried, his body buried, and then he was raised. What does that mean? What, what comes to your mind? Came back alive. I, not, right, not asking for anything profound. I just want you to actually, uh, listen, I want you to actually think Jesus died on a cross and was put into a tomb for dead people, and he came out of it. He came out of it alive. He was raised. He was resurrected on the third day. And it says, in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, when we get down here then to verse 12, and we read Paul saying, If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I want to make something clear here, because this is something that we have had to deal with, some of us in here, about what people want to do with this passage, and what some people have mistakenly done throughout the years when Paul asks this question, they will agree, as all of you should, that when Paul tells of the gospel that he's given, and he says that Christ was raised on the third day, we all assume, rightly so, because the gospels proclaim it over and over and over again, that Christ was raised bodily. Right? It takes great pains to say, Christ went down, dead, and he was raised. Christ's body, dead, body was raised. And so that gets repeated over and over again. And this is the gospel that Paul proclaims. So now when he gets to 12, we already have front-loaded for us what Paul's talking about. Paul is talking about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That if this Messiah is proclaimed as raised from the dead, not just spiritually, not just in their hearts, not just in their minds, but literally raised from the dead, brought back to life, some people are therefore saying and making a claim that there is no resurrection of the dead. So then the question comes to you, what resurrection of the dead? What kind of resurrection from the dead? To which you should say, bodily. Thank you. Someone caught on. I know. That doesn't always happen. But bodily, right? No definition has changed. Paul is maintaining his same argument. I preach this. Christ has been proclaimed to you as raised from the dead, then why are some of you saying there's no resurrection of the dead? Brethren, this is important. It's important that you see that. That you see the tie from 1 through 4 to the beginning of verse 12, because it demonstrates to you that Paul is being consistent in his use of the word raised, or the way I'm using it, resurrection in a noun. That's important because there are people out there teaching falsely that when Paul gets here to verse 12, he changes his idea of resurrection. That somehow Christ's resurrection being bodily and some other people denying the resurrection for everybody else is somehow different than Jesus Christ's resurrection. And they're not. There is no way you can get around this. This definition throughout Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15 stays consistent the whole time, lest you tear it up into pieces and make no sense of what Paul is saying. Make no doubt about it. Christ is proclaimed and has been proclaimed by Christians that he actually died in history, in reality, and was actually raised from the dead by God bodily, and then ascended bodily. And just as a side note for you as Christians in here, the world thinks that's crazy. But you need to believe it, because that's what Jesus did. That's what Paul is saying. So our definition then of resurrection has to be that. We can't change it. We can't make it fit something else that we want it to fit. And we can't allow other people to try to turn it and make it say something that it's not. It is talking about if Christ being raised from the dead bodily, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead bodily? I want you to see that crystal clear. I want you to see that. 
And now I want you to see why this is of such importance and why this is the crux of the issue, church. Why? So he draws out their logic in verse 13, if you want to look there again. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Down to 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, and here's the conclusion for all of you sitting in here, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Brother, notice Paul's conclusion that if one comes to Christianity and yet denies the bodily resurrection of all believers, that he has in fact denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I, and, and I listen, I, some of you were, were shaking your head and that's great. But I want you to hear the order that Paul does that. It's not the normal logic you would think of. Paul's inverting this, this idea here. You would think what Paul would say is, some of you are denying the resurrection. Well, Christ was raised. Of course you'll be raised. But that's not the issue. People are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Christ raised, but there's no resurrection of the dead. And he's saying, listen, he inverts it. He doesn't begin with Christ. He actually begins with you. He says, listen, if there is, listen to how he says it. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ himself has not been raised. He inverts it. That's how serious this is. It's not just that, well, okay, Jesus was died and rose bodily, therefore you will. The, the point is this. If you deny that God is going to raise the dead, you cannot say that, he, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's an impossibility. It's inverted. You can't deny the latter and then affirm the former. Impossible. And notice what he concludes. Paul inverts the logic. He says the resurrection is actually proof. Our resurrection, a bodily resurrection, is actually proof that Jesus Christ was raised bodily. But if we're not willing to accept that as the heart of the issue, if we're not willing to come to this text and believe that Paul is fighting against that, then you need to conclude with him rightly that if Christ has not been raised because you deny a bodily resurrection in the future, then your faith is futile. I mean, you probably don't use futile in your vocabulary every single day. I sure don't. I don't say, that's futile, bro. <laughs> So let me tell you what it means. It means it's worthless. It's garbage. Your faith is stupid because your hope is in a resurrected Savior. And if you are not resurrected bodily, then neither was He. Your hope is stupid. It's meaningless. It's vanity. It's emptiness. You're still in your sins. You think you've come to know God. You think to come to know His plan. You think you have been brought near to Him. And He says, what does He say in 19? If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are the most, we are, we are of all people most to be pitied. And why? Why would He say you're the most to be pitied? Well, uh, why doesn't He just say, well, listen, you just got that wrong. There's going to be some kind of other, you know, maybe spiritual resurrection that you get to partake of. And He says, no, 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 no. You'll be the most to be pitied among people because your hope and your labor and in your life is that you'll be raised from the dead. I hope that shocks our American Christianity. When have you ever thought that if we are not raised from the dead, then I am to be pitied? Not just, oh, you were wrong about your doctrine. Because, because how does Paul in the letter... He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And for the reason, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, the conclusion here is, if Christ, if our hope is only in this life of a Savior and Messiah that we follow in this life, and we are not raised, then the reason Christians are the people to be most pitied is because they labor for something they will not enjoy. 
They take their time and their energy to labor and they will never reap the fruit of it. Have you ever thought about yourself that way? If Christ is only your hope in this life and not in the resurrection to come, that you're actually to be pitied as a fool, as someone who has banked all of their hope and their work and their time. I mean, think about it, brother. Look at this little church. Do you see how many kids we have in here? All of these families, all of the time being spent to pour into them, to pour into you, to go to Smith's in the cold, to go to the abortion the abortion clinic, to have some of you move into our houses. Why on earth would we go through the trouble of doing all of this work in hopes for a kingdom that will not perish, that we will inherit one day if we're not resurrected? But I don't think we think like that. I know. I don't. This comes to me the same way it should come to you, as a complete shock to your system, because we think that we're just banking up in our spiritual bank account floaty dollars and and pennies that just float to heaven, and we're just going to go sit in it one day as a spirit. And we don't think that we're going to enjoy the fruit of our labors in a real heavens and a real earth one day. We don't think we're actually going to enjoy the fruit of our labor. But Paul says, brethren, Keep abounding in this work because your labor is not in vain. You will actually reap and enjoy the reward for your labor. So that's what's at stake. That is the crux of the issue. This is what is at stake when we talk about the resurrection. But now we, So now we have this idea of what this resurrection is. Right? We could all say the resurrection is bodily. That's the Christian's great hope. This resurrection's bodily. But now we still need to answer the first question that I tried to start this with. How is this part of the work of Christ? Because to me, that seems kind of confusing, how that's part of Christ's work and accomplishing, right? You think of Christ's work and you think, well, Christ comes and he... It's like how you preach the gospel to someone. He lives the perfect life I didn't live. He dies the perfect death I should have deserved. And then we kind of... He's, he's raised, right? <laughs> we just tack it on to the end. But we usually think, okay, that's what Christ does. He comes and he lives for us, comes and he dies for us, so he gives us eternal life, and then we stop. And then when we think about the resurrection, we think, how is Christ's work of resurrection accomplishing something? How is it bringing about salvation for us? And Paul, thank you, Paul, spells it out for us so that we don't have to guess And we don't have to go flying through a million other scriptures. So the second part, the work of resurrection as Christ's work, is going to be here in 20 through 26. I am going to skip some of the verses at the end because that's a rabbit uh, trail I do not want to get down. So verse 20, Paul says, But in fact, notice now he's moving into his own line. This is what Paul believes. Paul is now moving away from the line of reasoning that says there's no resurrection of the dead. And I hopefully brought that importance to you. But now Paul is going to make connection for you as to why resurrection is important, but how it fits in with Christ's work so that it actually comes to you as something meaningful. So, but moving into his own proclamation, his own line of argument, but in fact, Christ has been. That is, a, that, that, that is a phrase of describing something that has happened, been completed, going on into the future, never to be undone. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So here is where Paul is going to begin to make that connection for us, right? This is now Paul's line of reasoning. He's moved away from the objection, and now he's moving into, listen, garbage over here, but we know Christ has been. Not maybe, not we think. Christ has been raised from the dead, and he tells us, 
what that resurrection, his bodily resurrection is. He's going to expand on this. Christ has been raised from the dead. Well, what is that? What does that mean? What was its purpose? Notice what he says right there in verse 20. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now that phrase, you probably heard that a few times in Scripture as you're reading um, in your Bible. It just means those who have died. Right, The Bible often uses that as a euphemism to speak about death. Those who have fallen asleep, they've died. And it says that Jesus, really affirming his death, that he was really raised, and this raising of Jesus bodily, is it's like a, it's like a foretaste for you. It's a sign of a reality that is to come. So Jesus being raised is just of this first fruits. It is like this first picking of a crop to to get a taste and to get a look at this large uh, harvest that is to come. And that's how his resurrection is described, that he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then he's going to tell us why that's important in verse 21. So look, for or because as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Now you may not know what he means when he says by a man, but I want to read this in Romans 5, give you, <clears throat> give you guys a, a little bit more uh, a background to this. So Paul is using very, very similar language here in Romans chapter 5, and he says, says this in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, there's that idea again, this one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So this man here, what does it say? That... Sin came into the world through one man. The curse of sin comes in through the world through Adam and his sin and his failure to obey God and do what God had tasked him with. But then Paul says like this in 1 Corinthians 15, For as by a man came death through Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. And then he expands on this in 22. For as in Adam, now he describes him, right? For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so the the idea then is this. If death comes into the world through the sin of one man, then in Christ, his obedience brings about the accomplishment of life of what Adam failed to do, and of what Christ actually accomplishes. So Adam in bringing death was not his work, but Christ in bringing men to life is his work. That is his work. He is actually not just fixing the mended story. He's progressing it. He's making the fix, and then he's saying, this story was supposed to go here, and I'm taking it here. That's what Christ is doing. Christ did not simply come to just forgive sins. He didn't just come to give you eternal life so that you would live on forever and ever and ever and ever with no end. He came to complete a task and accomplish a goal to where all history and all mankind was supposed to go. And that was to dwell with God. And as an Adam all die, so all in Christ shall be made alive. Brethren, here is the work of Jesus Christ. This is the capstone to his work. Not only does he come in and redeem people from their sin, he brings them to their final destination and completion. And that is resurrection. Because ask yourself this. Will you die? Do you even think about death? Do you think about your own mortality? Do you think about how quick you could be gone? Do you think that you are somehow impervious to death? 
I guarantee you, my friend, you're not. You will die. And what will that death say of you? What did it say of Adam? Guilty, sinner, deserves it. So here's the dilemma then, and why Christ's work must be more than him just simply forgiving people. Because here's the catch. You die still. You ever thought about that? Christ Jesus forgives you. The wages of your sin was death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, and yet you die? That's a problem. Because death is then making claim over you and saying, guilty. Guilty. The sting of death still seems to come. So Christ, maybe he forgave you. Maybe he redeemed you from sin, and yet you still die. And so we need Christ to come in to do this because what does a resurrection from the dead do? It vindicates you. It is your vindication that though you die, you'll be raised. It vindicates you, Christian. It vindicated Jesus Christ, did it not? He rose again on the third day, was proclaimed to many, and then he ascended on high and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And then what was he given? A name above all names. It was his vindication. It was his vindication of who he is. And in fact, for you, the resurrection of the dead, your bodily resurrection is your vindication that you are not a part of your father Adam anymore. You now belong to Christ. So when you die as a Christian, you have hope that I will be raised with Christ. I'll be vindicated. Otherwise, death has its final say over you. It has the verdict on each and every one of you and me. So this is a part of Christ's work. This is, and listen, this is how Christ understands it himself. I mean, obviously, take, take Paul's word for it. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But here, Jesus Christ. This is Luke 24. And man, he read a little bit from it. Made my heart glad. This is Luke 24, beginning at verse 44. This is how Jesus understands his role and his accomplishment for the entirety of Scripture. He says to them, he's speaking to these disciples on the road, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened up their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. This is how Jesus Christ understands the entirety of the Old Testament. It was pointing forward to his work of death and resurrection so that you could be saved. So this is Christ's work. I want you to see how Paul continues to flush this out as now what resurrection should begin to do for you in your thinking in life. How you ought to live, how you ought to think in light of the fear. I mean, listen, it, how, do, how, do you, how would you normally live if you didn't even know in general? Obviously, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, right? At least... Nobody's going to raise their hand and say that they know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I can guarantee that you assume this. You think you're going to wake up tomorrow, don't you not? You think you're going to wake up and eat breakfast. Maybe you don't do that like me. You skip in, then you go hungry, and then you're mad halfway through the day. Nick knows. But listen, you assume what's going to happen tomorrow. You do. So what kind of life would you live if you literally, in your mind, had no idea what was going to happen tomorrow? You were just so lost and, and, and clueless and just out of your mind that I, I, I don't even know if my lungs are going to open up tomorrow and I'm going to breathe in air. I just don't even know. How would you live your life? I mean, that's crazy talk, but imagine that was you. How would you live your life? Fear and unguided, literally going nowhere, just... Just existing, like like the lamp or the bookshelf. It's there, but it doesn't. It's inanimate. It, it does nothing. It's not going anywhere. There's no trajectory, and there is no final outcome. There's no goal, and that, my friends, is what we call purposelessness. 
I mean, that, that is what we tell the atheists. That's what you have in your system, right? You have no meaning. You have no purpose. You have nothing. There's n it's not going anywhere. But you don't live your life like that. And Paul is going to flesh this out. Listen, he, he establishes resurrection, and he shows that this work of resurrection is actually the capstone of Jesus, Jesus accomplishing salvation. But then he's going to further it by showing how it fits into history. Which seems kind of weird, because I think when you read this, at first you're like, okay, he's, he's trying to argue with these people who are denying resurrection, and then he starts going off on like, okay, Christ is going to be raised, then you had his coming, and then he's going to deliver this kingdom, and you're like, whoa, we just got into like this kingdom, and Christ doing this and that, and it's, it seems kind of off, but I want you to understand what he's trying to ground. If you deny a future bodily resurrection and you find yourself in that dilemma and you do not hold fast that Christ's resurrection of the believer at the end of history is where everything is going, then you will have no trajectory that Paul is about to give us. You will literally be like the person who does not know what is going to happen at all to them tomorrow. And Paul does not want us to live like this. I think he's making this connection with this. I think he's, he, it's like he's, he, he's shooting that, that argument that's being made up, and this is the second shot right here. Psh, wrong. First one, this is part of Christ's work. Second one, psh, wrong. This is where history is going, and this is how the resurrection points to that. So go back to verse 23. Paul says, But each in his own order... And he's talking about the resurrection, right? Because he says before that, in Christ, all will be made alive. And so he's saying, there's an order to this. There's an order to this resurrection. Christ is this first fruits of this premier example of what uh, our resurrection is going to be like, of what the end of all things is going to look like. And he says, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, what? Those who belong to him. So everybody who belongs to him is then going to be raised. And then there's that transition here for us in 24. And he says, and, and quite literally, this is all it says. Uh, if you were just take this flat, and this is why you don't, don't ever get someone who's like, well, the Greek says, because you need to be thankful that the ESV puts in, or whatever translation you have puts in a word for you here. It says, and then comes the end. If you just wanted to be so wooden and sound like a doofus, it would just say the end. I mean, serious. That's all it says. It just says the end. It's like it, it's like getting to the kids' book, right? You're reading, and then it's like, oh, we're done. Oh, okay, two words. All right, next book. Actually, go to bed. But so so Paul makes this very odd transition and says, listen, Christ is raised, and then those who belong to him are raised, and then he starts making this conclusion with then how you should view your life, how you live it, because of where history is going. When that happens. Paul is saying this. It's a wrap. It's the end of the story. There's nothing left to be told. Right? There, there's, there's no more furthering or progression of this story God has unfolded to history. That is the climax of the story. The end. And then what does he say? What does he do at this end? It says, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Verse 25, For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. So I want you to, I want you to see that. That this work is not only the capstone to what Christ Jesus does in his person, it is actually the capstone of history. And therefore, it is the capstone for where you are going and what you're looking towards. Does that make sense? So if some person comes running up to you, or maybe you walk by them, running up would be scary. You walk by someone screaming in your face, the world is ending tomorrow. Give me all of your things, sell it. The world's ending. You need to go off and sell everything. You need to get ready. End of the world's happening tomorrow. Christians say that. You'd say, nope, not the end of the world, right? That's not where history is going. It's not, it's not some random ending coming out of nowhere about ready to blow you to smithereens if you don't sell all your things and repent. It's the resurrection. 
that's the end. That is the wrap. And so that should tell you then, okay, listen, if that is how history is going to conclude, this great grand resurrection that looks like Jesus Christ, where he's the first fruits of it, and that is how we're going to experience that, that's where we're going, that's how history is going to end, will that not change how you live now? If that guy over there who says that the world's ending, the world's ending, the world's ending, well, he's wrong. That's going to change how I live. Because if he's right, well, then yeah, why would I keep all my stuff just to watch you get blown to smithereens? I'm going to sell it all. I'm going to, I'm going to get ready for that. But in fact, if the resurrection is the end, if God is drawing our attention to that in the work of Jesus Christ, in this resurrection, we are going to think and we are going to live much differently. Because notice what he says about this kingdom. All right, so here's the end. And he says, when the end comes, he's delivering over a kingdom. He's delivering a kingdom to God the Father. After doing what? After destroying every rule and every authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign until he's put all of his enemies under his feet. So I, I want you to hear that from... Uh, Two psalms. I've read these a million times, and I don't care. These are great psalms. And the New Testament loved these psalms to death. And you should too. But I want you to understand why he ties that in there. He ties it in there like this. So this is Psalm 110. He's, he's quoting from here, from Psalm 110. So that verse 25, For he must reign until he's put all of his enemies under his feet comes from Psalm 110. It's a direct quotation from Psalm 110. I just want you to hear Psalm 110. That's what it says. The Lord says to my Lord, speaking of Jesus Christ, ultimately, He says, sit at my hand, at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. So let me just ask the basic question right off the bat. Jesus Christ, where does He currently sit now? At the right hand of the Father. And... What does God say to him as his father? What does he say? Sit here until what? I make your enemies your footstool. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that God the Father is going to make Jesus Christ's enemies his footstool? Subject it, right? If I'm playing you in a... I don't want to play Michael in a game of pickup, but let me say I'm playing my son in a game of pickup, right? <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't beat him with both hands behind my back and go, yep, son, better luck next time. You put me underneath your footstool, right? You'd be like, what? You're using that wrong, man. That's not, what that, that's not what that means. It's not you losing. It's you winning. And not just you winning. If I say, man, I played you in a game of basketball and I made you my basketball enemy to be my footstool, it means I decimated you. Like I crushed you. It wasn't even a contest. Right? So that's this idea, is that the Lord is sitting, Jesus Christ, at God's right hand, and God is telling him, sit here until I accomplish something. And that accomplishment is this, until Christ's enemies are made his footstool. And then verse 2 is actually going to flush this out. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. And then I'm going to go down here to verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of His wrath. He will execute judgments among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, He will lift up His head. So what you get then is that this work of putting His enemies under His footstool is Jesus Christ ruling from the right hand of the Father and putting and pursuing all of his enemies until they are under his feet. And he's doing so until it's accomplished. This picture in Psalm 110 is of a conqueror who is going out to conquer, and he is not going to stop until he's done so. And here in Psalm 2, you get the same idea fleshed out. Though Psalm 2 is not quoted directly right here, it still bears the same idea, and it still bears the same weight. So Psalm 2, 
begins with these nations raging against God, against His anointed, ultimately against Jesus Christ. And then verse 4 comes a response to these nations who are rebelling against Jesus Christ. And it says, He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, Here is how God speaks to these enemies. It says, As for me, here's His terrifying wrath. This is how God unleashes his wrath against his enemies. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That should be terrifying for his enemies, right? You would think what he would say would be, okay, here's how I speak to my enemies and my wrath. I'm coming with my sword to slay all of you. And sometimes scripture says that. But here God says, as for me, I've set my king in Zion. You laugh, you rage, Here's my wrath. I've set my king up. I've established him. And then David is going to tell us what this decree looks like. What does it mean that God, in his judgment and in his wrath, has set his son upon the throne, has set him upon Zion? He tells him, verse 7, he says, I'll tell of the decree. And I think what he is saying is of of the decree coming out of this installment of this king at God's right hand. And he says, here's the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So now when we come back here to 1 Corinthians 15, I think you get a little bit more context and a little bit more uh, fullness to what Paul is saying here. This end that comes with the resurrection, when Christ delivers up this kingdom to the Father, He does deliver up that kingdom, but He does it after He accomplishes those things decreed for Him. When he accomplishes those things, then this resurrection will come. The end will come. That's what's going to happen. But it's going to be after he does this. It's going to be after God gives him this decree, and this decree is carried out. Because 25 says this, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Well, who were those enemies? It was was the nations. Yes, good answer. It, It was the nations. It was you. It was me. It it, it wasn't just sinful Israelites here. Now it's viewed as the entire world. And he says that he's going to put all of them under his feet. And Psalm 2 nuances this for us and says, here's how he's going to put them under his feet in his judgment. He's going to possess them. At the end of the day, he's not just going to crush these nations and pound them into a fine dust. Out of his judgment will come the possession of these nations as an inheritance. Through this judgment will come an inheritance of nations for Jesus Christ. And so he will reign until he has accomplished this, until his enemies are under his feet. But then notice 26. What is the final enemy? Thank you. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. How is Jesus Christ going to accomplish vanquishing his final enemy? Your bodily resurrection. Does that does that change how you would think about where everything's going and now how you're going to live? In fact, is that going to change for you the importance the bodily resurrection ought to have for you and for me and how we live as a church and what we believe? Brethren, he is putting that enemy down. One day, the last enemy which is your truest enemy, death. Because it did have right over you. It had had property right over you. Death was your master. 
And Jesus Christ, he comes in and destroys it and he says, wrong. The final verdict for God's people. And notice at this point, it's not just God's people. This is everything. This is everything. Gets vindicated by God raising the dead. Hey, this is what Paul says in Romans. I want you to listen to this. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. This, even creation knows this. They believe it better than we do. Listen to this. This is in Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For, listen to this, the creation with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, right? Who subjected it? Adam did. And not willingly, he brought it upon creation, but because of him who subjected it in hope, verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Church, this, 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 this work accomplished in the resurrection is not just simply for us, this is, and I've, I entitled this message this, the resurrection in the vindication of God's world. This is God's vindication of everything that he's made and everything that he's done. Because Genesis, he said it's good. And he's going to finish by saying it's good. And he's going to complete that. He's not going to let it go off. He's not going to let it fall into oblivion. He's not going to let it go down in flames. He's going to rescue it. And he's going to rescue all those who believe in him. And he's going to put all of his enemies under his feet. And he's going to put death under his feet. Brother, he's going to vindicate you. At the last day, he will vindicate you. So there's the work, right? In those, in those two aspects, right? Christ's work is actually an accomplishment of salvation in, as the completion of of Christ's work, right? So you don't have forgiveness of sins, which you will hear us preach all day, every day. I'm not knocking it here. just want you to understand that not just salvation for the forgiveness of sins, but that you actually don't have that without the resurrection of the body. And if you don't see that as pervading history, where it's going, how you ought to then live, then you're going to miss that. But now the second and the last thing comes to us in regards to the resurrection is what is the nature of this resurrection? Now, I, I, already, I, I already made the point, I think pretty strongly, that this resurrection is what? Bodily. Yeah, we're getting better at this. Bodily. But I want you to know and just hear Paul say it because Paul goes literally to great lengths to convince you and for you to have without a shadow of a doubt that this resurrection is bodily because some people will hear what was just said and will still ask and look at 35. Here you get this, this it's like this arguers coming in with again, again with Paul and he says, but after concluding all the things that we just said, right? It's like you weren't listening, <laughs> but someone will ask, Here's the question. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And I, I want you to hear that again with sort of the sarcastic tone that I used because once again, it's not a boring question coming in an academic tenor, right? This is not, well, Paul, you know, as we've studied and sat here together, how, how, does, how is the body raised? What does that look like, Paul? This is somebody who is trying to undermine Everything we've just talked about for however long, hopefully not over an hour. Everything we've talked about. Because notice what he says in verse 36. He digs them. You 
foolish person. Now, this is, that is the same phrase, similar, a very similar phrase when Paul speaks to the Galatians and says, Oh, you foolish Galatians. This person is standing in a bad spot asking this question. But how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And here's why this question would come in. And here's how you could see it in even our own context. Listen, we, we have a context in which we live in which you tell somebody in America who's grown up in a secular country for the last, what, 50, 100 years, however long, about a bodily resurrection from the dead. And that just seems totally like from Twilight Zone. Like that is comic book fiction about talking about people coming up from the dead. I mean, heck, they got TV shows like that, right? People, uh, zombies and, and people living, you know, life after the dead. And this person is asking in the same tenor as a Christian and saying, well, with what kind of body are they raised with Paul? These people are brought up from the graves. What are they? The idea is this. Are they going to be walking around like zombies? Is that the greatness of this resurrection? You just come up out of the grave and... I mean, if you're lucky, you've only been dead a little while, so maybe you got a leg and an arm, but it, you know, you've been dead like Abraham. You're just like dust. And, and th these people are, are mocking this idea of a bodily resurrection by trying to ensue that this resurrection could be no glory, you know, great and glorious resurrection. And Paul calls them a fool. And notice what he says there in 36, what you sow does not come to life until it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Now, don't get lost in the analogy here. Uh, we don't stretch the analogy so far as saying, well, if He's saying that it's the kernel and it's not the thing that comes, are they totally separate and and, 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 and apart from each other? And the, the answer is no. The, the, this isn't some physical body and then you get some glorified, you know, super spiritual body. He's not making this radical distinction. He's saying, in order for you to get the bodily resurrection, well, that, that first one, the bare kernel, has to go down and it has to die. That's what you sow. But God will give a body, as he says there in 39, but God will give it a body to, as, excuse me, gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. And then he's going to continue to develop that for us. So let's just read this. He says, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another kind. There is one glory of the sun, speaking of these heavenly bodies, and the glory of the moon, and the glory of the stars, for stars differ from stars in their glory. So once again, don't run off with the analogy to, to some insane degree that because Paul talks about heavenly bodies, but he's really just talking about stars, the, the things that are up in the firmament, their body, the way that they are composed is somehow describing this completely, totally different bodily existence, you know, some spiritual existence that you're going to experience apart from your bodily existence now. He is simply demonstrating to these people, listen, you ask the question in a mocking tone, like you're going to come up as like a zombie. He didn't say zombie, but you get the point that I'm making. And he's trying to tell them, listen, you're a fool. That's not the resurrection. It is much greater. It is much grander. It's much more glorious. It's not the body that goes down, you fool. It's the bare kernel. God has described all sorts of bodies to different entities for their own glory and for their own purpose. So he's just simply making a distinction between the body that now is the earthly one and the body that is to come, the heavenly one. But notice that it doesn't change. It's still the earthly body and the heavenly body, not some heavenly spirit existence. So notice how he includes that in 42. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Because here, here's where you got to keep going with this because people have twisted this to their own destruction. 
twisted it, claiming that the resurrection is not bodily. But Paul could not be more clear right here. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. How is it going to be? How is this so? How is the examples Paul has set up for us going to prove that for us? Listen to what he says. What is sown is perishable. What is sown into the ground? What is, what is put into the ground? What is the bare kernel going down into the ground? Your body. Now. Your broken one. Your, your body inherited from Adam. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. Church, what is raised from the ground? What went down and what's raised? Your body. Now, Paul's already answered the question. You're thinking, well, is it just going to be like my body was before? He goes, no. It's going to be of a different glory. Just like there's a glory for the birds, just like there's a glory for the sun, and a different glory for the moon, but all have their distinct individual glory. And he says, so it is with the resurrection. It's not that the resurrection deals with, on one hand, here's this bodily, earthly existence, but on the spirit, on the, on the resurrection side, it's just spiritual, and we get to escape this earthly body, and we just get to escape this physical creation. No. Just as different bodies exist, but with one glory, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What gets sown perishable is raised imperishable. Your body raised imperishable. Now, I don't know how to describe that for you because my body is not imperishable right now. It's of a different kind. It's got a different glory. Just like the different bodies in the heavens have a different glory and a different kind of glory, they do, but it is your body that is raised imperishable. Listen in 43. It is sown in dishonor. It, the body, is raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And here is where people want to come in. This is They want to just hyper-focus. They want to take this one and rip it out of what we just read. Because what did we just read? The kernel goes down, your body goes into the ground, perishable. But what gets raised imperishable? Your body. So when Paul now gets down here, to, uh, to, excuse me, 44, and he says that it's sown a natural body, but raised a spiritual body. He's not saying you get raised a spirit. He's saying the body that you get raised with is not from the, it's not, it's not from your natural, uh, your, your natural birthing. It's not from, it's not from the nature that you have inherited simply from Adam. It is not a natural body that you have been given. Rather, it is a spiritual one. Or as Paul has already said, it's a heavenly body, but make no mistake, it's a physical body. Though it's sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And then 45, thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And we just need to ask ourselves, how did Jesus Christ become life-giving spirit? How did he enter into that role? So that Paul would make this quotation right here. By being raised from the dead. Bodily. That's how Christ becomes this life-giving spirit, this last Adam. He is raised and became life-giving spirit for us so that our natural body would be raised a spiritual body like His. Verse 46, But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam... We shall also bear the image of the man to heaven, Jesus Christ, and bear his resurrected body image. 
Church, you have got to follow that line of argument all the way through, lest you find yourself in a place where you end up denying a bodily resurrection. But Paul makes it abundantly clear from 35 all the way through that argument and with the word raised that he is speaking of nothing in doubt of a bodily resurrection. That is the nature of this bodily resurrection. But it's not simply a resuscitation of your dead body. It is a transforming of your physical body into one like Jesus Christ. And that should give you great hope. Because if the capstone to Christ's work is this resurrection, and you come up out of the grave, and your body is still enthroned in sin, then it's not a great hope. And he's taking great pains to tell you, listen, they mock because they deny that resurrection. But let me tell you, the resurrection is grand and it's, and, and it's of utmost importance. It is absolutely amazing. This resurrection body is one that, co- that corresponds to the great work that Christ has accomplished. The body you receive will not be a bad note at the end of a song. It will be the triumphant ending to a grand accomplishment of Jesus Christ. So as I close right here, I just want <clears throat> I just want to read these last couple of verses. I'm not going to go through them. I just want you to hear them because really everything that has been said is summed up here in these verses. But then I want you to hear Paul's application of what I already stressed to you guys a little bit about what this ought to do for us then. How should we then apply the work of resurrection and our own resurrection to our life now? And here's the last couple verses of Paul in verse, or excuse me, in in chapter 15. Paul says this, I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this, church. This is for you. Verse 58, listen. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's pray.